Um, I was at Elex two years ago, and that was my, one of my first exposures to this community, to the academic community around languages and linguistics, language learning. And something very memorable happened. It was the final closing session at the very end when we were sitting in a big circle and discussing things. And there was a little bit of a solemn atmosphere there because, you know, dictionary sales are going down and what are you going to do about it? And the big bad internet companies are doing everything for free. And somebody said, I don't remember who it was, but it was kind of the conclusion of the, the whole conference for me. Somebody said that the future of dictionaries are not dictionary products, but it's lexicographic assets built into other products that create higher level, higher level value. And that really stuck to my mind, and I went home with that, and I had to digest this you know, idea, this inspiration. Um, and we then set out to, to do something with it, and we created a product, and we created even a company which is based in Austria, it's called Alfari. Um, and a lot has happened in those two years, and I want to show you, I want to give you a glimpse today of, of what we're doing, what our mission is, and what the first product looks like um, that we have created in collaboration with Oxford University Press. So before I forget to say it, after this uh, talk, you can go to the OUP stand outside, and to the left of the table there are those uh, A4 formatted flyers that summarize the product that we currently have. Um, so this is to, you know, just to also maybe in show that this kind of conference can really have an impact in the real world. <laughs> Yesterday we have heard a wonderful presentation by Professor Briscoe, and I thank you for that, Mr. Briscoe, because this was a wonderful introduction to my talk in a way that you laid... <laughs> no, it was more than that, but you... <laughs> it was much more than that. You created a great product. Um, but it also laid, in many ways, the groundwork and spares, spares me a lot of talking because you laid the groundwork for explaining the role that machine learning and artificial intelligence can have in a product like this. And we build on that as well. Um, and you, you also explained the value and the importance of formative feedback so that students actually have a chance to learn from their mistakes and not just get the right-wrong type of feedback or just the summative feedback where it's really just testing and not teaching. So that's a, that's a paradigm shift that you're introducing there. Um, and third of all, uh, very importantly, we're not here to replace teachers. And I think you, made a, you argued that very well. So thank you for laying the groundwork for me here. And um, I'm going to build on that. Before I go into showing the app, though, uh, I would like to show you a few slides about the kind of questions we've been asking ourselves. Because I think in life, in general, it's very important to start with the right questions before you go and seek out answers. Um, and one of the first questions we've asked ourselves what does it mean to know a word? For a layman, this seems like a simple question. Well, you know, a word has a definition, it means something specific, and that's about it. Um, but of course, we all know that it means much more. So I'll give you our perspective on a few dimensions that, um, of this question. And just so this one-hour talk is not too boring, I want to start with an interactive quiz. So I would like to ask you, to classify these words. Now we're talking about machine learning, it's all about classifiers and classifications. Well, humans are the best classifiers. So please go ahead and just call into like the first column, we start from the left, and um, you can, if you have any ideas, you can call out the label. Frequent words, Frequent words. okay. I would say that's, that's not wrong, that's pretty good. <laughs> it's uh, heading in the right direction. Maybe uh, go a little bit in the direction, what type, what type of word? Functional words, all right? Functional words, I would say, is like a, almost like a synonym of, of what we have here. So it's, it's absolutely not wrong. You're very close to the right answer. Um, <laughs> it's, it's functional grammatical words, yeah. Functional grammatical delexicalized words, that's correct. 
What about the next one? That's a tougher one. Abstract words, all right. Highly collocational. Highly collocational words, okay. Those are properties of those words, features. They are not wrong. You're heading in the right direction again. <laughs> This is called a scaffolded learning experience, what we're doing here, hints and feedback. <laughs> um, I can give you one hint that will really help you. This list actually has a name, like a capitalized name. And we all know it. I think, Patrick White, you know it for sure, and you could feel free to come up with the answer. <laughs> Oxford 3000, that's correct. <laughs> so, I think it's okay if I advertise a little bit our strategic partner here. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, <laughs> I spoiled it. You would have gotten that. That's the academic word list. Um, and of course, there's an overlap between Oxford 3000 and the academic word list, but I made sure that these words are the ones that are not included in the Oxford 3000. So, the overlap is a small one. What about the next one? Concrete words. Hmm? Where would you typically find words like this? Children's books. In children's books. Okay. And th th does that mean they're very frequent words, right? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, it's doesn't have a specific name. Um, what, in what kind of lists would you find those words, though? Domain-specific. Domain-specific. Mm, yeah, I would be a little bit more specific in the wording of that. <laughs> topical, there you go. Topical list, that's correct. Those are topical lists. Low frequency, but also uh, low, low cognitive. Uh, so you don't need to, you know, because they're mostly concrete nouns. And it's very interesting because laymen intuitively think those are the words you need to learn because they're easy to understand and they're concrete things like all the objects in the kitchen and all the parts of an airplane and all, all those things. There are thousands of words and there are many apps out there who actually focus on this and we, we all know that's not very useful. Um, what about the last one? Concrete. Yes, very good. <laughs> So do you see a pattern here going from left to right? They, oh, I'll give it away. Yeah. They become less and less frequent. And so um, the question is, guess what column we focus on with our product? <laughs> column one. Column one. <laughs> yeah, column one starting from zero is correct. Um, the Oxford 3000, that's our initial focus, but we do actually plan to, to expand into a slightly higher level, B2 level product with um, a focus on English for academic purposes as well. Okay, so now that we classified a few words, um, let's look at those examples of the, of the Oxford 3000. I hope you can read them. And I would like you to, to now classify the, there are three different types of lexical chunks, the way that I've summarized them here, because we also all know that language is not about words, it's about patterns, as Mr. Hanks has eloquently explained yesterday. Um, it's all about patterns. And so, you know, we've asked ourselves, what kind of patterns are there? How do you categorize them? And how do we teach them? What's the first column? What do you recognize here? Crime wave, I'm glad to say, to be on the receiving end. What kind of patterns are those? Fixed, hmm? Fixed patterns, okay. Where would you find them? You find them in the dictionary. Sorry? <laughs> 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 Haven't practiced this presentation enough. <laughs> 
Um, yes, those are, those are patterns that have a dictionary definition. So they are either compounds or they are idioms. Um, also, phrasal verbs are patterns that have their own definition because they have their own distinct meaning. I'll give away the others. Um, there is, in the middle, we have collocations and patterns. I summarized them in one column. Um, and then there is lexical bundles, things like to give a piece of advice or a crime against humanity. They don't have their own dictionary definition, but they're also more than just a collocation. They are bundles of text that frequently reappear in the English language, and knowing them is valuable. Um, Michael Lewis um, was somebody who popularized the idiom principle for, that goes back to Sinclair and people like that, uh, and, and he popularized that in, in language pedagogy with his book, The Lexical Approach. We don't necessarily follow the lexical approach, it's just one of the many theories that we have you know, used in our, in our thinking. And he says, he has a very nice quote, that's why I put it here, uh, that native speakers carry a pool of millions of those different types of chunks in their long-term memory, and they just draw upon them to, to create fluent and idiomatic language. So it's really all about chunks and patterns. And it seems like maybe we set out to be the first vocabulary training app that really explicitly focus on chunks and patterns. Um, let's look at the types of problems that B1 learners typically have with difficult words, because that also helps to answer the question, what does it mean to know a word? And I'm looking at B1 learners because that's our initial target group. So we focus with our current app on intermediate level learners, and we have plans to expand it later on towards B2 and C1, but I'll talk about this later. So there are the grammatical issues, for example, confusing uh, stative versus dynamic verbs, this book isn't belonging to me, he isn't owning the flat, things like that, and we have um, countable versus uncountable nouns, I'd like some information, so you hear this a lot in Germany. Um, <laughs> then um, we have gradable versus ungradable ad adjectives. Uh, it's absolutely hot, yes, it was absolutely hot yesterday. Um, it was a very fantastic film. Adjectives versus adverbs, confusing them, you need to hit it very hardly. Um, there is a funny anecdote of a big German publicly uh, traded company that when they, when they did their IPO, uh, they had a presentation, like a big in front of all the banks and so on, and they, they ended on the last slide, they ended their presentation with the slogan, we hardly work. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is a high stakes mistake, uh, this example. Verb patterns, gerund versus infinitive. Uh, we look forward to receive your reply. I actually keep making this mistake myself. Doing or making the mistake? Making the mistake. <laughs> That's another one. Uh, phrasal verbs, separable or inseparable. Quite funny, my sister's leaving her children with me this afternoon and I'll be looking them after. <laughs> I smoke and I know I need to give up it. So uh, this is really tricky stuff. And this, that was the grammatical issues. Let's look at some lexical issues that B1 learners typically have with, with vocabulary. Um, confusing strong collocations. Put on something warm or you'll take a cold. Strong smoker instead of heavy smoker. This is typical mother tongue interference. Mm -hmm. In Germany, again, you hear this a lot. In starker Raucher, strong smoker. Um, a lot of those uh, ty types of mistakes that I present can have um, L uh, L1 interference as the source, but it can also be other sources, so it's quite, it's quite mixed. Uh, collocations with delexicalized verbs, that's the one. Uh, yeah, they did a lot of mistakes. Um, dependent prepositions after nouns, verbs, and adjectives. I hope we can take advantage from this unique opportunity, and so on. Um, commonly confused words, our principal consideration. Please ensure instead of ensure. So those are words that exist, but they're confused. They arrived very lately. Uh, confusing international cognates, the famous false friends. Eventually, I will join you for dinner tonight. Uh, eventual, <laughs> that actually means maybe. Uh, have you seen the actual weather forecast? That's an interesting cognate because it works in many different languages, uh, not just in, in German, but also in Spanish and Italian, I think. So the current weather forecast, that's what they mean here, of course. Uh, suffixes and prefaces. This work is very inorganized, unpolite. Phrasal verbs, mixing them up, 
My grandfather passed out last year <laughs> and we miss him very much. <laughs> now, this is, this is, of course, uh, an example of a very salient example sentence. We actually, um, one of our consultants is Philip Kerr, I'll tell you about this later, and he, he came up with a three-page list with criteria, bullet points, three full pages with uh, criteria for good and salient example sentences for exercises. And that was one of them, they should cause a laugh. So <laughs> that was one of the criteria. Let me finish, please don't hang out on me. Um, and of course, spelling issues. So to summarize, what does it mean to know a word? There's uh, Norbert Schmidt with his taxonomy on that question. It's a very big simplification here, but it's about form, meaning, and use, and then different sub-aspects of form, meaning, and use. Um, I have another little quiz for you, which probably about one-third of you will already know if you have visited uh, Lexcom, which I did in 2013 uh, in Sweden. And this is uh, that, and I always do this in presentations because it's fun, I ask people to define the word to cause. And people come up with, I mean, do you want to try? But and it's, it doesn't really work here because half of you know this. But people come up with, uh, it, you know, make something happen and so on. And then I say, do you want to be more specific? And all native speakers fail in this task. I have had one or two non-native speakers who actually got it right and said, well, obviously, after thinking a little bit about it, to cause means to cause what type of thing? Bad thing, thank you. Then because when you look at the collocations, this is a screenshot from the Sketch Engine, courtesy to Sketch Engine, thank you guys. Um, when you look at the top salient collocations of the, word, of the verb to cause, here's the list of things. And then I, I let people try, you know, figure out what do those words have in common? Sometimes it takes a while. <laughs> so that's quite a revelation for people to see. You know, that's part of the aspect of knowing a word, is how it's being used, what collocations typically uh, go along with this. And of course, Sketch Engine was a uh, revolution in that regard in, in terms of visualizing this. So the next question we asked ourselves is, which essential feature is missing to move vocabulary acquisition from only receptive, which most apps out there are, you know, just about receptive learning, to a more productively oriented learning of, of vocabulary items. And the answer we came up with after a lot of research and after talking, including our research partners at the University of Lancaster, the uh, answer that we came up with is feedback. Simple as that, formative, corrective feedback. And, and that's not a trivial task to automate, as we saw it yesterday in, in Mr. Briscoe's presentation, that that's far from trivial, and you have chosen to focus on, you know, to put the focal point on uh, grading and assessing a free written text. We have, in our approach, chosen to focus on formative feedback and optimizing that. And I'll tell you later a little bit about how we, you know, what the trade-off is that I see here between your and our approach. So here are three quotes. It's the uh, most powerful single influence enhancing achievement is feedback. That's from the big study of studies from Hattie. Then we have here a quote from the German uh, Ministry of Education, something. Detailed, task-specific feedback supports the development of language awareness and language learning competence. This is part of their prescribed curriculum. Uh, and then we have our friend Philip Kerr, who in one of his recent blogs, I'm quoting here, formative feedback as opposed to right-wrong testing style feedback strengthens retention of the learning items. This typically involves the learner repairing the error rather than simply noticing that an error has been made. So giving the feedback is not enough. You also have to then let the learner repair the error. And that's really what strengthens retention and raises language awareness. One year ago, I presented a prototype in this very room uh, at Lexcom. And um, this is how it looked like. Some of you in the room actually remember this, were here. Um, and I want to show you this as a kind of a you know, time travel because to contrast it with what we have today, what we have developed in that one year. So this was an early prototype uh, with text-based gap exercises. You, you put something in the gap and you get very detailed, very sophisticatedly worded feedback on different aspects of why this word would be maybe not quite uh, fitting or uh, whether, wh what aspects are right, what aspects are not so right in that context. And so, of course, we could not turn this into a product because it's too much to read, it's too sophisticated. The attention span of the average teenager today is something like 15 seconds. 
And so um, that, that, that was too scholarly. But it was a necessary step in between to actually learn for ourselves in this process of experimental discovery that started about three years ago when we entered on this journey. Um, and it was an interesting stepping stone. So that's, some of you remember this. Um, and so the third question we asked ourselves is, this prototype was not engaging to the typical student. Engagement, student engagement, is the number one factor for learning success. Students need to be engaged with what they're doing. Uh, all the science behind it doesn't matter. If the student is not engaged, then nothing works. And so how do you engage and motivate learners? And of course, it has to be through the medium. It has to be gamified. It has to be mobile. It has to look sexy. You know, it has to be consumer-grade design what, that people are used to from apps today in order to really have a sticky product and to get a lot of uptick. And the revolution, the, the, no, not the revolution, the breakthrough, the breakthrough that happened is one of our uh, team members, uh, the product guy, Sven, he woke up one night and he had this, uh, really, it was an epiphany, um, which was this FIBU, the feedback butterfly, which is a visual, a very smart visualization of all the different complex output in terms of feedback that our engine uh, would generate. And the feedback butterfly is, um, called FIBU, and it simply visualizes it by having four wings that grow or shrink depending on the quality of your answer in terms of one of those four aspects, well, in terms of all four aspects. And the aspects are grammar, spelling, meaning, and what we today call word choice. So it's naturalness, idiomaticity, word choice. We call it today word choice in the app. Um, here is a historic document. This was the first sketch that my colleague uh, made when he woke up at night with this epiphany, um, how that would look like. And this has been really our, uh, very much our centerpiece ever, ever since in the app. So one more slide about the inspiration of the project, and then I'll go into actually showing you the app itself. Um, I call this the OLD inspiration. It's a very personal thing that I'll tell you now which is a little bit embarrassing, I admit, but the fact is that I actually took the Oxford Advanced Learner's Dictionary to bed with me for about a year. <laughs> I didn't have a girlfriend at that time. <laughs> and it also didn't fit under the pillow, it was too thick, so I, I, that, that didn't work, but I had it next to my pillow, and I used to fall asleep um, while studying that dictionary. Um, and every time I would open it, sometimes I could not do it more than three or four minutes because I would discover a new pattern a new, in terms of the structure and I had to process this mentally. But sometimes I would just browse it for an hour and look at different words. And this was very early on in the process, like two and a half, three years ago. And um, it really inspired me because of the potential of, of, of the data of such an advanced learner's dictionary, in that case it, it happened to be the Oxford uh, Advanced Learner's Dictionary, um, because decades of, of passion and care into the last detail and nuance went into this work by, by a team of, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 pub, uh, editors. And, and you can really see that. And I, what bugged me all the time was there's so much potential in this data, but you have to be very geeky in order to actually make use of this and benefit from this. You have to be very geeky. I think it's less than probably 1% of the general population that, that, that benefits from the full potential of, of the data that this kind of uh, book gives to a learner in terms of productive information, patterns, collocations, uh, labels, and so on. You have to know the abbreviations. And that really bugged me, it bugged me for months because I saw unlimited potential, what you can do with this data in a technological product. So we approached OUP, and of course OUP became our very first partner, and I want to thank you, especially Patrick White over there in the corner, um, because you saw the potential of our project and you supported it from the beginning, along with your colleague Joseph Noble, uh, and that was really the foundation for the strategic collaboration that we entered with, in, with OUP, which is, by the way, not exclusive uh, <laughs> for the others of you, <laughs> um, to, to create the Oxford English Vocabulary Trainer that was released globally last week. So if you have an iOS device, you can download it. We'll have an Android by uh, November, and I will show you the app right now. But to summarize what we do in one sentence, 
Alfred technology unlocks the power of the Oxford Learner's Dictionaries for hassle-free and engaging vocabulary acquisition. Just what we do. So let's hope this whole thing works out technologically. Uh -huh, I see I already used up half of my time. That was not planned. So the Oxford English Vocabulary Trainer with, you saw it maybe very mm -hmm. small on the bottom, it says Intelligence by Alfrey. That's us. Um, this product, this app is the very first app. It has, it's quite narrow in its uh, scope for now, quite focused, I would say. And it has three important USPs that I want to show you. The number one is that it's aligned with course books, potentially aligned with course books. So you don't have to have a course book. You can also use it as a standalone app, but it's designed as a blended learning product. And the way it works is that you pick one of the OUP course books. It will include English file and others. You click on it and you have the units and you can activate the units to go, so to say, in lockstep with the class, okay? So the teacher says we do unit three uh, starting from today and you go here and you activate unit three and you have exactly the words that you need from the course book. And so it's tightly integrated with, with, with what's happening in the classroom and with the teacher's curriculum. Much more tightly integrated than than any other product which would not include the structure and the, the curriculum and the syllabus of the course book. That's the USP number one. Um, the next one, of course, is the big thing here, which is the feedback butterfly and how you interact with the content and how the exercises look like. So um, the paradigm, the trade-off that I talked about compared to Mr. Briscoe's solution, where you have a free text writing, which is great, and then you can assess it, we don't have that. What we have here is we have a fixed text by an author where the intention of the author is already known and you then gap out things intelligently, like you gap out, for example, the headwords that you want to learn or we also have exercises where we gap out the collocation to the headword that you're learning in order to practice the productive use. And so we can give much more specific and accurate feedback because we know what was the intention of the author, okay? Um, so here we have an example. After some heated, <laughs> a decision was finally taken. Um, the gap exercise currently is our only type of exercise and we all know the statement death by gap fill. Um, and we, we're, <laughs> we're avoiding this, this slow and painful death by making it actually a fun and interactive exercise with our scaffolding. And this scaffolding process I'll show you now, it reflects very much what I did with you in the beginning when you had to classify the words. It's a combination of hints and intelligent feedback. So let's look at that. Um, what would be an answer that you think might, might fit here? Try to honestly answer the question. Debate, okay, debate, I heard debate. After some heated debate, let's see. I can tell you now that this is not the, in, parent, in, in, in quotation marks, uh, the right answer. It's not the word that you set out to learn. It's not the word that the, the teacher or your course book wants you to learn. Um, so it's not the one you'll be tested on in class, but it's still not a wrong answer. We know that, right? So let's look what happens. I submit the answer and I get feedback. And what do I get? Good job. Yeah, try a word that has a very similar meaning. And I can now tap on the four wings. I mean, FIBU is very happy because all the four wings have full size. Full size means maximum quality of the answer in terms of all four aspects. Medium size means something in between, not perfect, but also not utterly wrong. And then the small sized wing means utterly wrong. So spelling, grammar, you enter the right part of speech, great. Uh, try a word that has a very similar meaning. And word choice, this combination of words sounds natural. See, heated is marked in green, so it actually highlights to me that heated debate is a nice collocation. The after should not be green, that's still a little bug. I mean, we're still improving this algorithm. There are some bugs in here. But it works great for the most part. What you also see is that I've received five out of seven experience points. And that means I get rewarded for what any other app out there would today probably say it's the wrong answer unless it has been hard-coded into the system, which is a lot of work. It now gives me a hint for free because it sees I'm doing well and, it, uh, and FIBU doesn't want me to frustrate. So in terms of the scaffolding uh, system of making sure the student never gets too frustrated, but it also is never too easy. It's like finding this gold, golden middle. 
um, um, that, that's exactly what it does. So it gives me a free hint, which is the first letter. Okay, and so, you know, A, what could that be? Um, I don't know, so let me say I, can, I need another hint. I use the jumbled letters hint, and here we see a nice example of how we used a very limited space on the smartphone um, to turn the keyboard into a hint by highlighting the letters that are contained in the word. I think that's a cool feature. So let's, argument, thank you, argument, that's correct. All right, now please notice that I have earned six out of seven points. Why, why didn't I get seven out of seven? Because the last hint that I used actually cost something. That was the jumbled letters. The first hint was given for free as a reward for my you know, coming close to the right answer, but the last hint cost something, and that means in terms of the gamification, uh, the user has the incentive to maximize his points um, because he compares himself with other students or there's some kind of competition going on. There are all the gamification incentive mechanisms in place in this app. And of course, that means you try to get by without the hint, and only when you really need it, you use the hint. And that means it's a self-regulating system in terms of not making it too easy, but also not making it too hard for the student. Um, what you, uh, what's also uh, very important here is that the hints have a relative cost. So the more points you earned yourself, the cheaper the hints become. And you never lose the points that you already earned. So it's not an absolute cost. And that means you never get penalized for try and error. Because this is not a testing app. This might be the first real vocabulary teaching app. And when you teach, you shouldn't penalize the student that tries different things and gets something wrong. In fact, getting something wrong should be an occasion of learning from your mistake. And that's all those uh, fine-tuned, I would say it's a very fine-tuned gamification system where we use the extrinsic incentives um, and motivation that's generated by the gamification in order to, um, to get, you know, to incentivize the correct pedagogic behavior. A lot of thought went into this, and this is the kind of stuff we've been doing with Philip Kerr, amongst others, uh, to, to really fine-tune this. He's an ELT writer in, based in Vienna that helps us a lot with this, and he's a vocabulary specialist. Um, let's go to the next one. Oh, this is a good one. Please note that seek and expert in this exercise are already highlighted in bold, and the algorithm does that automatically, fully automatically, because it recognizes that those words are strong collocates to the actual gap word, which is the word the student set out to learn. Um, I will use a hint now, which is the free translation hint. This is uh, German, because I put German as my L1, ein Rad. The reason why we give a picture hint and a translation hint for free, we have about 10,000 pictures uh, in here that are hand-selected, the reason we give those hints for free is because even though the example sentences are carefully designed to contain enough context, you can never make it completely uh, uh, unambiguous. And so we need to make sure it's not a guessing game because that's another source of frustration. And we make sure it's not a guessing game by giving some types of hints for free so you don't get penalized for actually trying to understand what, what does the system want from me. So I understand what to put, uh, obviously. It's advice, advice is the right answer, to seek expert advice from a mental health professional. But just for the sake of demonstration, um, I would now put um, opinion, okay? Let's see what FIBU tells me about that. Check the word combination. This combination of words doesn't sound so natural. So we have full wings on spelling and grammar, but on meaning we have a half-sized wing because your answer has related meaning. It's not very similar, but opinion and advice are somehow related, aren't they? I mean, they're semantically similar. You can already imagine what kind of technology is behind there. We have different sensors for semantic similarity. Um, and some of them are distributional semantics, and all of that stuff is operating uh, in real time as we speak on our servers. So your answer has related meaning. Now, that's encouraging. I don't get your answer is wrong, but I get encouragement. Two aspects are right. Two of them are okay, not completely right. It's, you know, you're close, you're not stupid, you didn't put in banana or something like this, uh, <laughs> which I had for breakfast. Um, and in word choice, it says this combination of words doesn't sound so natural. Now let's look at it in detail. It actually highlights seek and from. You don't seek an opinion from somebody. Again, those highlights are fully automatically generated by our algorithm. You don't seek an opinion from somebody, but there is an expert opinion. 
So you really learn, that's why expert is green, you really learn to differentiate and that increases the student's language awareness because most people out there have never even heard of the concept of a collocation or of a compound or of a chunk and, and they also not just haven't heard of those words but they're actually not aware that language operates in these ways. And being, becoming aware of those linguistic aspects will make them into more competent language learners. And it's, I think, very nicely visualized here. Um, so, all right, I'll try again. And I earned some points. And I, I will not get penalized for this trial and error process again. That's, I think, pedagogically a very important subconscious message that we're sending to the student. Let's look at the definition. This definition comes straight from the dictionary. It's, uh, here you have the first glimpse of how we integrate the dictionary into a learning product. Uh, words that you say to help somebody decide what to do. All right. I also have an audio hint so I can hear the pronunciation of the word. And I have the first letter and the jumbled letter hints. Those are the types of hints. We are in, in the process of introducing a multiple choice hint where the exercise stays the same, but you get multiple choice as a type of hint because it kind of reduces the universe of possibilities for you. And then you just need to choose the right one. I think, again, that's probably a useful way of including multiple choice, which are, of course, dreaded as an exercise from a pedagogic point of view. But as a hint, this is actually useful. So, all right, let's put it. Let's put suggestion <laughs> and see what happens. Seek expert suggestion. Oh, now that's interesting. Now, on meaning, we have the full-sized wing because suggestion has very similar meaning to advice. It's closer to advice than opinion, so we get the full-sized wing on meaning, but we have the smallest size uh, on word choice because this combination of words sounds very unnatural. I think we still have to improve the wording. It should say, this is, it's like almost a mistake. It's probably a mistake, it should say. It's probably a mistake um, because, and by the way, the wordings are constantly being improved, like the wordings of, of the feedbacks when you tap on the wing. And you see that there are different reasons why the wing of like, meaning can be small. For example, when it's opposite, it's small. But when it's very distant, it's also. So there are different aspects behind each wing that we are hiding behind them. And there are dozens of sensors from our NLP toolkit, so to say, which are operating in the background behind those wings. And that will influence what message the student actually gets in plain language. So what's the problem here? Well, neither expert suggestion, no no seeking a suggestion is, is very idiomatic, okay? It's very unusual to encounter this in a corpus. This is, of course, based on corpus pattern analysis. Try again. Advice. Perfect. 5.5 experience points, one and a half I've used up for hints. Okay, the later, again, the later I use the hints, the less they cost me in terms of my valuable points that I'm collecting because I will have earned more points by my own trial and error. And it's only when you do trial and error at absurdum, like when you don't progress and when the answers don't become smarter, then the system eventually forces a paid hint on you so that you, you make a progress. Uh, it also does things like picking up whether you actually read the feedback or not and improved. So it will give you a badge. That's another gamification element that I cannot demo right now. But if you do that, if you then actually improve your answers in terms of the feedbacks that were given to you, that means you have actually paid attention to the feedback, which is a behavior we want to incentivize. So you get the badge for being a good student, so to say. And of course, it's some cool badge. It's not you're a good student, but uh, it's the nerd badge. But it's, it's, it, has a good, uh, it has a good name, which makes it cooler. <laughs> Here's, uh, we can afford to buy enough paint to do the whole house. Let's put sell as an example for what happens when you accidentally put the opposite. And meaning you have to try an opposite to your answer, okay. Uh, let's put maybe bought instead of buy. We can afford to bought, all right. What would you expect here? Some grammar feedback. There you go, grammar. You entered the wrong form of the correct word, okay. You entered the wrong form of the correct word. And the grammar feedback, uh, we are in the process of expanding the range of what the grammar feedback covers. It will cover all kinds of lexical grammatical things, uh, like countable, uncountable, and things that are based on dictionary labels, but not only. Um, and it will include that in the message. So in the next few months, 
the, the scope of, and the, the uh, amount of detail and the variety of feedbacks and messages that you get will be greatly expanded, but always in plain language so that the typical B1 learner really gets the message and can relate to it and can understand it. All right. And now we'll have the last example. <coughs> to make the soup, she <laughs> carrots, potatoes, and cabbage. Let's look at the free hint. Oh, obviously, that's cooking, right? Kochen in German, cooking, that's obvious. So the typical L1 uh, problem here would be I'll put cooks because you, tip, you cook a meal, right? You, you, you boil the vegetables, but you cook a meal. Okay, so cooks carrots, let's see what happens. And, you know, meaning, very similar meaning, that's good. Word choice, this combination of words doesn't sound so natural. You don't typically cook carrots. You cook, you know, lasagna or a meal. So I think you get the point. Let's, let's, let's see how the system handles spelling. Um, boiled is the right answer in this case, boiled. But let me spell this with an H, boiled. Well, it cannot tell you anything about grammar, meaning, and word choice because you have put in a non-existing word. So you have dotted lines on that. Can you see that? Dotted lines. Spelling is a half-sized wing, and it says you probably meant the right word, but spelt it incorrect, sorry, incorrectly, and it gives you points for that. It, it, it rewards you for that. And now if I spell it wrongly again with a uh, J, boiled, okay, what will it tell me? Did you mean boiled? So FIBU just gives up on you. Spelling is not so important nowadays anymore. You know, idiomaticity and <laughs> yeah, because you're surrounded by spell checkers, and this is last century stuff. You know, spell, <laughs> learning how to spell right. And then when you have a, when you actually you have people with the spelling weaknesses, how do you call it? Uh, um, that's you know, it's not the most important thing. You get your points for meaning the right thing, and and then it actually helps you. Did you mean boiled? But you still have to type it in, so you do get to like. Uh, you know, repair, you, you do get to repair the error, which increases the retention. All right. So that was that. Um, then you get a summary of your practice session. You see your, your average FIBU, so you see where your problems were. My prob problems were mostly with word, word choice, so, you know, that, and that's actually true. I have to personally improve my idiomaticity in English, and I looking forward to the advanced level product that we, that we are programming for. Because I think you should always work in a company where you work on products that you yourself need. This is like the gold standard for being motivated in your workplace. Uh, <laughs> um, and you see here the summary of, of points. You get um, uh, you know, X number of knowledge points, X number of experience points. We distinguish knowledge and experience points because the experience points are the points you collect for the learning process. So even a weak student with a weak memory who tries a lot of things and always sticks to the rules and reads the feedbacks, he can, he can win in terms of experience points. And knowledge points are the actual mastery. So how well have you mastered the words? How quickly could you come up with the right answer and so on? And so we distinguish those two, again, for pedagogic reasons, because otherwise the same students that always win and always get their A's, they will also be the winners in the gamification here. And that's not what we want, because we want to have it more balanced, right? The learning process is what, what's important. And I think this is reflected in every design decision we, we have done uh, in the product. It's not about the outcome so much as it is about the learning process. Um, so this is truly formative feedback. All right. Um, I'd like to show you another feature. I need to watch the time. I have 15 more minutes. No, how much time do I have left? 15? Five? Five or 15? Five. five minutes, okay. All right. I'll stretch those five a little. Um, <laughs> so let's look at, at the third unique feature of this app, which is the, I think, the world's first semi-trilingual dictionary. Semi-trilingual dictionary, okay? So what does that mean? I can put here two different uh, mother tongues. I have here German and Turkish. Turkish is not for real for me, but uh, it's German and Turkish here as an example because uh, in Germany there, it's a case which happens a lot. So you have, for example, children with Turkish immigrant background um, sitting in a German school learning English. I mean, there are millions of them, okay? And that's just one of the language combinations. And you have this phenomenon everywhere in the world. So um, let's see if I look up a word in the dictionary because this app includes 
the whole dictionary. Yeah? It's a dictionary app plus learning app. It's combined because <laughs> things have to be combined. So let's look at it. Um, bank. Here we go. I look up the word bank, which is a famous polysemous word, and I see it means bank and ufa, but I also see what those words are in Turkish. So we have 21 languages. This is also, again, thanks to um, Patrick White and his, in his department uh, of creating this multilingual database. 21 languages that you can combine in this way, and it's based on a monolingual English learner's dictionary plus translations on a sense level into those 21 languages. And that really, and then you can go into the sense and you see the, you know, example sentence and the definition in English, just like a monolingual dictionary, but you have your two translations, which really, I mean, today more and more people again come to recognize that bilinguality is important in the language learning. Um, let's look at a more interesting example. Let's take, for example, I can also search the German word, for example, Haus. Yeah, I can search in any of the three languages. Let's look at Haus. And we see that house actually means house and house in English. Uh, so there are two different word senses, but in Turkish, those two word senses have different head words. So this is a really interesting case where the poor student would be completely confused. What are they talking about? Because in Turkish, it's two different words, whereas in English and in German, it's the same head word for the two different senses. This is only possible thanks to this multilingual database in the background. Um, let's look at another example where you can actually navigate. Let's say I look up pause as a noun, and then I see all the senses, and I click on ara, interval, and then I see interval as an entry, and I see it means abstand and pause. So you can really navigate in this multilingual database. That's really cool. And you can listen to it, and most of all, you can say add to practice. I want to learn this word, and it's added to whatever you get from the course book. So you can also use the whole app without the course book, just as a dictionary app where you look up things, and then you memorize them, because we all know how angry we get at ourselves when we look up the same word again three days later, right? So this is um, an example of this useful combination. Now, I want to pay tribute here because I've been tr paying tribute to various people in this room already. Um, and here I need to pay tribute to Ilan Körnerman and his family, who are, I think are recognized as the, in a way, inventors uh, of the semi-bilingual approach. And um, we've taken this a step further and made this into a semi-trilingual approach uh, based on that multilingual database. But the, this is the power of ideas. Um, you, you know, ideas float around and this is what they do. So I think we need to recognize the uh, Kernerman family for their contribution to, to this great idea. Um, all right. So I think this, that's it for the app. Of course, you would, as you would expect, there are statistics. We don't need to go into this. There's like all the statistics and gamification. There's an average FIBU. Uh, what we can do, thing, uh, what we plan to do next year is have teacher reports that actually tell the teachers what are the problems that the students have, like the specific problems the students have. Um, and it can even suggest clustering the classroom. Let's say you have five clusters and you put students together that have similar problems so the teacher can go and do more direct intervention or you put students together that have different problems so they can help each other out with their exercises. There are all kinds of things that you can do because it's based on qualitative data. And this qualitative reporting, instead of just quantitative, you know, have they done the task, yes or no? How about perc what percentage did they get right, yes or no? Instead of you have really qualitative evaluative data about or assessment about the students based on the daily activities, which goes back to the same dozens of linguistic sensors that are behind the intelligent feedback. So we use this in two ways. We use it for formative feedback, and we will use it for um, very deep and intelligent reporting to teachers to help them be more targeted in their interventions. Um, that's it for the app. I probably ran out of time, but there are a um, few more things that I wanted to say, and probably you'll have questions. So what are we going to do about this? <laughs> I think we just switch to the questions. We switch to the questions. All right. Thank you very much, Daniel. Sure. Um, Now I, f now I finally know what, what I need to do in order to improve my English, start a new company. Um, the questions, please. Maybe before, before the questions, uh, one more person that I wanted to pay tribute to is Michael Rondell, because Michael, you are basically the godfather of this project. <laughs> <laughs> You've been coming to workshops with us and really getting very deep into the whole, I mean, the reason lexicography plays such a role in this product is because of you. 
came to visit us in the Ukraine. We had those workshops together, and you always connect us to the right people. So. Right, and so and and this is actually the most important point. This is, of course, Adam and the Sketch Engine team. And Adam was the very first person. I would have said it otherwise in the Adam tribute later on, but now that you ask me, Adam was the very first person um, that got us started on even thinking about having lexicography and corpus linguistics as part of a language learning product. This was way back in 2011, the first encounter. And in 2013 at Lexcom, we actually made a deal with Adam. He said we can, we can reprogram, re-engineer, re so to say, reverse engineer all the sketch engine features into our product because his server, your, your guy's server, would be too slow to handle our load. And so we did that with, with our guy, Artem. Um, and, and that was a very generous gesture and, and deal. So in many ways, Adam is the spiritual father and you're the godfather of this, <laughs> 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 of this project. Now questions. Um, I just wanted to ask about what corpora you, you based your collocational statistics on. Um, it's, it's a combination. We received uh, some of your guys' data, so some of the, uh, the sketch engine corpora, but um, also we have the, the corpus of Oxford Dictionary example sentences uh, and a few other things which all together are actually a secret. <laughs> it's part of our secret sauce. <laughs> But the principle is clear. It's corpus pattern analysis. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. And it looks really exciting. And I would love to try it. Um, a related question. Uh, the choice of the, um, of the material, was it made by, by people? I mean, or was it automatic? And did you have a specific audience in mind? Like, for example, the Turkish-speaking community in Germany? or? whoever else, I don't know, because I couldn't help notice some sort of biased examples. For example, the person who cooks is typically a female, and the, you know, the good old doctor, is a, the expert, is a male. And well, we, <laughs> we, saw, we, Thank you. We, 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 we saw four examples, so I think that's a very too, too small uh, select. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a coincidence. Um, no, the content is neutral for b one level learners anywhere in the world. And it's English for general purposes. It's focused mostly on the Oxford 3000, but also goes beyond that if the course books contain other words. Um, but it, it is focused on words that are interesting to learn in terms of the types of problems that we've seen earlier in the presentation. Um, and the material is a combination of hand curated by experienced ELT authors on the one hand, um, and on the other hand, automatically drawn from a corpus of example sentences from dictionaries um, where we apply very sophisticated ranking criteria in order to uh, determine whether the sentence is a good gap fill example, sample, example sentence or not. It needs to contain enough content words, enough collocates and so on. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, great presentation. Yes, hi, Ilan. Uh, I have three due diligence statements. First of all, I might be the one to blame for that uh, gloomy conclusion of last ELEX, so I'm <laughs> relieved that it has been so fertilizing for you. Um, also, uh, that we are friends, and uh, I appreciate a lot what you are doing. And about the semi-trilingual, Actually, we have done a semi-trilingual dictionary in the 1990s cool. for Russian immigrants to Israel based on an Oxford elementary learner's dictionary. Wonderful. So uh, nothing new under the sun. <laughs> usually not. Now, in due fairness, yeah. um, also regarding uh, Ted Briscoe's talk yesterday, the both of you are dealing with, the way I understand it, with English as a foreign language. And maybe it seems to me more appropriate for academic, English for academic purposes. And how do you see the thing of English as a global language? And all of those mistakes, so-called mistakes, going in there, uh, you gave a couple of nice ones from German. I remember in Zurich Airport, which is a multilingual uh, country, 
very high level of English and they had signs, no toilets at gates available. In obviously a German construction. They changed it since then. <laughs> but um, anyway, what is, this is kind of bringing you to, to learn in a, in a very systematic English of how it is here in Britain, isn't it? And you are applying that to B1. That's Do correct. Do you see any room for flexibility? Well, there is. There, of first of all, there, first of all, we don't necessarily subscribe to the English as a lingua franca movement. I think it's quite controversial anyway. So there are different opinions about it. So we don't necessarily subscribe to that. That's one thing. The other thing is that um, there is a lot of flexibility going in, in the direction of, of um, uh, English for academic purposes because one of the things that I wanted to tell you about is the outlook. What are we going to do in the, in the future? This is just the very first app that we created in collaboration with OUP, but we have plans to do more than that with OUP, but also without OUP, uh, which goes into the direction of text-based exercises where you actually work with a text, like extensive reading, but on top of the reading, you have vocabulary work that you do, like detecting chunks and doing all, that, all those kinds of things. You can really come up with great exercises there. And once we do that, that would probably go in the direction of B2, C1 level, uh, and we can introduce academic texts uh, there very well. And, and I think that's, you know, and then it's all about the text that you choose. Then it's much less determined by us what, 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 this, what kind of English you're actually learning and so on. So this is the future. It will be more open. And we actually want to create a platform where publishers, but also ELT writers, uh, individual groups of writers, whoever, can curate content, create modules, and put them on our platform and sell them on our platform, so like a marketplace. And what we add is the intelligent feedback and the evaluative framework, so you get a common view of the learner's progress in a blended learning environment. But that's, that's kind of a future outlook. That's our long-term uh, vision. We're working towards that. Um, so I hope I more or less answered your question. <laughs> yes? Okay, I'm going to stand up because I, I, firstly, I want to say what a great product and uh, really interesting. And now I want to be a party pooper and quibble. Uh, and let's go back to your uh, example. After some heated argument, yeah. and um, I used to work for Oxford University Press, but not in the ELT division. <laughs> if I remember rightly, um, the examples... Uh, in the, in the uh, Oxford Advanced Learner's Dictionaries are not actually taken from a corpus. They are invented for pedagogical effect. And I, I started worrying about after some heated argument because I wanted debate or discussion <laughs> to score maximum points. And when they, do. Me, they do, they do. And when you told us that argument scores one, one higher point, um, I said, no, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, and then I thought, well, maybe, okay, so two, there are two questions, and, and the same actually, I, the same about essential to seek expert, something or the other. What happens if you make opinions and suggestions plural? Um, that, would that improve the score? Um, Might very well. It's automatic, yeah. so I cannot okay. predict it. Yeah. But to, to get back to your first point, yeah. we do give maximum points for discussion and debate, and the FIBU shows full wings on all four aspects. So the, f the user really gets the message that's an acceptable answer. The only reason, and that's maximum points for the answer which is not the, r the answer that is expected, and that the reason for that is because if you look at the context, somebody decided that the word argument needs to be learned and will be tested on. It's either the course book, and they need to learn to the course book, or it's the student himself looking it up in the dictionary. So he does want to end up practicing the production of the word argument, and that's why we lead him to that. But on the way to that, we try to send the right messages, which is discussion and debate are perfectly acceptable answers. And I think that came out. Okay. Of, yeah. um, I, th <laughs> I think you probably, we could look at this afterwards. We should, we should for um, sure. It's not a perfect I think system you yet. We need to. Uh, to apply slightly more relaxed criteria mm -hmm. than what I was seeing. Maybe I was missing it. Okay. We, we can explore this together. Thank you.
Last question. <laughs> if there is one. <laughs> yes, I just wanted to ask, is your app available already? Or yes, well, you... the, it's available on iOS since last week. Uh, it's the Oxford English Vocabulary Trainer, but you also find it when you search for Alfrey. And on Android, it will be available from November. Um, and it's also for you know, phone and tablet. And the feature scope will constantly be expanded. So currently, there is no tutorial. There is no learning objective wizard. All those onboarding mechanisms, they will be added. It's a very early launch. And we've uh, made a conscious decision to come out with a minimum viable product so that we could start incorporating feedbacks from the market very early on. Yeah. It's an agile approach that startups do today. And, um, Maybe a final closing word for me, if I may. Um, <laughs> I would really like to en encourage this, because in this room there is so much combined knowledge. And again, I see potential and it drives me mad if that potential is not unlocked or used, just like with the dictionary. I would really like to encourage you to seek out partnerships with technology companies or commercial companies to take this knowledge and raise the standards that, uh, of, of products and raise the standards of what teachers come to expect because it will also benefit Alfrey. It will benefit Alfrey if the overall standard of what is expected goes beyond the level of a Duolingo, which is dilettantic, I'm sorry to say, in, in terms of the pedagogic and linguistics that went into that product. And maybe in two years when, when we're meeting back here in Elex, there will be another keynote like this with a product that was inspired by... I. I allow myself the luxury of that thought, that it might happen. Thank you very much. Sure.